Bonjour à tous, hello everyone, and welcome to the press conference for the Tree of Life. Uh, a lot of behind the camera talent here at this table, starting from the far, my far left. Uh, he worked with Mr. Malik on the Thin Red Line. He's in charge of all the visuals, I was told, non-computer graphics, I was told, which I find hard to believe, Mr. Grant Hill. <laughs> Sitting next to him, the founder of uh, River Road Entertainment, and as such, he worked with uh, Mr. Sean Penn on Into the Wild, Mr. Bill Pollard. <laughs> Skip the two in the middle. Uh, pres president of Plan B, and as such, Mr. Brad Pitts, longtime producing partner, Ms. Didi Gardner. <laughs> she worked with Terence Malik on The New World, and she's, I'm told, working on Mr. Malik's next project. She also executive produced uh, a film called Take Shelter, which was shown yesterday at the Critics Week. Uh, and which stars the young lady in the middle, Miss Sarah Green. <laughs> yes, which makes it easy to segue into the before-the-camera talent, the young lady as Miss O'Brien, Jessica Chastain on this side of the pond, Chastain on the other side of the pond. <laughs> as Mr. O'Brien, Brad Pitt. and conspicuous by their absence, um, Mr. Sean Penn and direct, writer-director Terence Malik. So would any of you be kind enough to tell us why they're not here today? I mean, I'll address Sean uh, not being here. He uh, is in Haiti, as many of you know, he's been doing a lot of work there. And uh, the recently elected or inaugurated uh, president, uh, they were just meeting on uh, NGOs and, and his work there. So he's on his way, should be here momentarily. So, Didi, Sarah? Sure. Uh, Mr. Malik is very shy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would say that I, I believe his work speaks for him. Oh, no, that's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> but for the moment, we'll turn we'll, the volume up. <laughs> for the moment, we'll settle for this. First question here, second question over there. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, Bruce Kirkland of the Toronto Sun and Sun Media. Uh, I have this sensation that perhaps Terrence Malick would rather be bird watching than filmmaking, and uh, I share that sentiment. But nevertheless, given that he uh, so rarely makes films and drags himself away from his uh, relationship with nature, you have a feeling that it must be something special. So here we are with the Tree of Life. So I'm curious to hear from Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain. Uh, about working with a man who creates cinema more like a French Impressionist than a normal, and I put normal in quotations, more linear, more conventional cinema. This must be uh, an extraordinary experience, but also very different in terms of what he's expecting from both of you. Yeah, I could, I could go on far too long, and uh, you have three days to answer that. Do about Terry's process, but it was very, very interesting with us. So the, the quick strokes were, it's a, you know, uh, our section of the story takes place in the 50s, and Terry started by renting the entire block and then dressing it as the 1950s, and therefore allowing us to walk outside, to, to go wherever we wanted. He would have a couple of kids jumping rope outside. And, and his idea is, even though he gave us, he handed us a very dense script, his, he, he never wanted to, what he called, hammer and tong a scene to as it's written. He was more interested in catching what was happening on the day. He's like a guy standing there with a big butterfly net and waiting for that moment of truth to go by. So the kids themselves were not given the script. They weren't allowed the script. They had a closet of clothes. They put on what they wanted to put on that day, and that's what we shot in. And we would do two takes, two takes, and and... Terry would also bring in, he, he would get up every morning and write for an hour, and he, he would give us pages in the morning, single spaced, like three or four pages, and, and we kind of developed something out of that. And, uh, and I think because of that is, is why the, the moments are fresh, because they are not, they're not preconceived in, in any way. 
the lighting, there was only one light in the house. Everything else was natural light, one light over the, the table, and everything was handheld. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a pretty incredible experience. I, I don't know that I could do them all that way because it's, uh, it's exhausting. But uh, uh, you, you see what you get. You want to, would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah, it's, for me it was a lot about um, giving up any idea of what I thought the plan might be for, this, for a scene or for um, a day that we were going to film. And it was all about capturing an accident. Right. And um, there are even scenes like we were sh shooting a grief section, and I remember I was watching Brad, and you were so good. And then there's this woodpecker going, speaking of bird calling. <laughs> there's a woodpecker somewhere. <laughs> it, but there's always ways to incorporate it, because even in the, um, in the trailer, when you hear the voiceover, there are two ways through life, the way of nature and the way of grace. You hear a bird in the background, and that's actually from the set, me doing... Um, that voiceover, and he loved the bird. I want to add one thing. He, he, would, he, he does what he calls torpedoing a scene. Yes. And the youngest child he called the torpedo. And uh, on the first take, if we're, we're, we're having an argument, we'll, we'll be going at it and raising our voices and, and doing as you do. And this, the, the second take, unbeknownst to us, he would just send in Ty, the torpedo, and we sit down at the table and suddenly change the whole tenor and tone of the scene. So this is, this is something that uh, would happen on a daily basis as well. Again, I can go on for a couple of days, so I'll, I'll cut it there. On, on the most basic level, for those of us who have never met Mr. Malik or even seen him, does he laugh? Does he never laugh? Yeah. Does he talk? Does he never talk? Uh, is he stern? Is he jovial? Does he eat? Does he like food? Here's the thing. <laughs> um, I did, yes, yes, and, and uh, uh, he even goes to the bathroom. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 he, he's quite jovial. He's, quite, he's in, incredibly sweet. He's laughing most of the day um, over at, you know, <laughs> when the dog would act up and bite one of us or something. I mean, this, you know, the, he, he finds pleasure in, in, in the day, is my point. And... Uh, I think this is the difference in great directors and good directors is that he truly loves all, all his characters in a very, very passionate way, like respects them, appreciates them, and uh, again, therein lies the difference, yeah? yeah? Question over there. Hello, I'm Francisco Cáceres from Ticket in Central America. Congratulations on your movie. I have a question for Mr. Right. Brad Pitt. Um, you wore, you've talked about how I was working with Mr. Terrence Malick, but I would like to know um, how much did you get inspired by working with him? I would like to know as a person and as an artist, um, how much inspiration did you get from him um, to, for the future of your career? Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a good question. It, it, it's changed everything I've done since because you do find, uh, I found in the past, that the best moments, what I thought were the best moments, were not preconceived. They, they were not planned. They, they were the happy accident that uh, Jessica was describing. So I've tried to, uh, the things we've done since, to try to uh, go more in that direction and uh, less on uh, making an, an intense study when you're going into it, but then working with non-actors and uh, trying to go uh, off the script, see where it, you know, what happens, where it takes you. Okay, question here, then here. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Farah Nairi from Bloomberg News. Um, a question for Brad Pitt and anyone else who'd care to um, reply. We're just wondering about how religious Terrence Malick is. I mean, does he believe in God? Because there's the theme of creation and, and the mystery and, and Job and all of these very religious and even biblical themes run through this movie which raises the question. So if you could speak about that as detailed a way as you can. No, it's a good question as well. Uh, we had a lot of theological debates throughout the process. Really interesting. Um, um, he's a very interesting man to talk to. I would, Sarah probably knows him best. I would say that uh, he's more of a, a, a spiritualist than a, uh, a compartmentalized uh, version of Christianity. I, he has a... a, a um, a more uh, universal viewpoint, in my in my opinion, Sarah. Would you like to speak yeah. to that? I mean, I think Terry's, you know, he's 
all, all interested in philosophy and all matters of the spirit, and he's extraordinarily educated in all religions and philosophies. So I think that deep interest speaks in all his work. Uh, insofar as Mr. Malik also wrote the script, uh, since he's not here, it would be inappropriate to ask whether there are any autobiographical elements in the script. But uh, for, were there any kind of autobiographical echoes in all of you, either behind the camera or in front of the camera? And are there things that the rest of us should know about how particularly Southern men and women choose to express themselves or not express themselves? Well, I can speak a little bit about the Southern upbringing, um, but you know, again, I find this film more more universal. I, I, I hope it speaks to people. Uh, it speaks to a, a, um, all cultures and as far as a childhood and deciding who you're going to be as you grow up. That point from from um, child to to young adult. And you try on things, some things work for you, some things don't, and you're being honed by the influences around you. And in this case, Terry designed it as the mother represents grace and love and all that is pure and good, and the father represents this oppressive nature, the, the nature that must survive and, and that, that will choke out another plant in order to do so. And the young child is trying both things on and figuring out what works for him and who he's going to be as he grows up. And then there's the, the bigger questions of, of, of the impermanence of life that uh, I, I think we all go through. Now, the, the Southern upbringing, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm making it a cliche almost, but there is truth to a, a purity and sweetness in the mother and a more, um, a father knows, knows best kind of mentality, a, a, a father as provider. And in the film here, you see that um, the American dream, as we grow up to understand it, is not, is not working for the, the, the father's on the tail end of that. And, and there's, there's a lot of anger because of it. And he, in turn, passes that on to his sons, inadvertently, unintentionally. Um, I do think there are elements of the story that are personal to Terry. There were elements of the story that was personal to me, but I don't think it mirrors uh, or, or it is an exact template of for either one of us. No, I mean, I, I would agree. I think uh, we've all had conversations with Terry during the making of the movie, you know, personal conversations about how the story relates to us or all individually. But I think one of the reasons Terry maybe shies away from forums like this is he wants the work to stand on its own. He doesn't want to say what it's about or what, whether it's autobiographical or not. He just wants every, the audience to bring their own thing to it and, and have it be a piece of poetry or a piece of art like that as opposed to him interpreting it or verbalizing it for others. And I, I think if you look back through his, his work generally, I mean, there is a, a humanity and spiritualism that, that sort of pervades most of it and Terry loves to examine those those themes and I think in in the context of this film um, one of the things uh, that you notice is that people respond very personally in, in a lot of cases to, to very different but specific points in the screenplay or in the film and that's I think what his great skill is that he, he can assemble a film that will allow uh, people to take away from it, in a sense, what's um, what's special or related or even spiritual um, in their own lives, and, and it gives you a very strong sort of personal connection. I think. Okay, question here, then here, then here, then here, then here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Ernesto Garrat from El Mercurio de Chile. I want to ask uh, two questions to the producers first uh, about the landscape. Uh, it seems to me that uh, m many of the shoot were look like my country, Chile. I, I don't know if you can talk about where were the shooting uh, because they are spectacular, really. And for Mr. Deep, I want to know. Okay, one step at a time. Okay. Mm. Uh, well, we shot in, in a town called Smithville, Texas, just outside of Austin. 
Um, and there was obviously a search going on uh, of different places to shoot, but that was what Terry responded to as far as the, the period and, and, and the kind of intimacy of the, of the town itself. And most of the shooting went around there, um, although we did go off in various parts of Texas and uh, out west uh, for some of the other uh, sequences, but most of it was in Smithville. Yeah, and those just those extreme nature sequences were in the in uh, the, the um, slot canyons in Utah and the, and the Great Salt Lake. So Sir, Iceland and sorry. oh yeah, please. a bit of that too. <laughs> this, you had a second question for Mr. Pitt. Yes, please. And to Mr. Pitt, if you can share some memories about your childhood. I mean, growing in in Springfield and what do you what do you remember? Because I think uh, the connection with the movie. You know, Middle Ooh, East, boy um, bad boy, Brad. something like that. Well, I, you, you know, for me, I grew up in in a um, in I grew up with Christianity, and uh, I I remember questioning greatly. Some th things didn't work for me. Some things did, and uh, just having a lot of the questions that the film presents, and I think that's that's why it, it, it spoke to me as it does. Sir, then, sir. Uh, hi, Brian Johnson from McLean's Magazine in uh, Canada. Uh, given that there's, this is a film very much about mystery, and it sounds like there was a fair bit of mystery in the making of it, in the sense that you're capturing happy accidents. I'm wondering, uh, Brad and anybody else who cares to reply, um, what did you feel you were making at the time? If you, if, if it is sort of evolving in in, in captured moments, uh, when you saw the film. Um, what surprised you the most about it, and um, what kind of impact do you think it'll have in America, where there aren't a lot of sort of religiously themed films, and uh, religion and Christianity tends to sort of fall on a particular side of the uh, of the political spectrum? Um, I, mean, I was surprised, one, by the, the structure I find um, quite ingenious, you know, and uh, I, uh, I think this marriage of the mic, you know, the, the micro with the macro, I found most interesting. You know, he tells this micro story of this family in this small town in Texas, and juxtapose it with the macro of the birth of the cosmos and cell splitting, and, and I, I, I find that um, quite extraordinary. That. Uh, there seems to be some, some parallel truth in that. Uh, um, anyone else? Well, and also, I, I think that, again, it gets back to um, you know, the, the sort of notion, I think, a little, uh, of sort of humanity and, and the broader gen, uh, general questions that come out of that. I, don't, I, I think that's more broadly its theme, perhaps, and specifically a religious theme. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of the overall question of, of how, you know, a film like that or perhaps any of the, his films come together, I mean, I think it, it's, it's, uh, the film itself is sort of an exploration. I mean, you have a, a sort of start and an end, and Terry has his themes that he wants to address within that, and some of them you know, come to the fore very quickly, and a lot of them evolve. Um, so I, I think he has a very clear idea of what he's setting out to do, but it's the way in which um, each of those individual aspects will, will make themselves known is what sort of people have alluded to evolves during the process. Um, question over here, then question over there. Uh, Jeffrey Wells, Hollywood Elsewhere. I'd like to direct this to Bill Collad and to Sarah Green. Uh, I seem to recall, I, I do recall either Bert or Harold Schneider saying <clears throat> in a book about the making of Days of Heaven, particularly the editing of Days of Heaven, that as truly gifted as Terrence Malick obviously is, he needs a tough friend with a stick, a, a producer ally who's uh, going to bring in a little discipline, a little rigor, uh, particularly in post. Do you uh, guys agree with that? And if not, how do you, what's your general feeling about working with him? I'll well, just start, let me start with, end by saying that Terry is actually the most disciplined mm. director I've ever worked with. He's there relentless. There's no one more rigorous. Yeah, he's relentless. He works day and night, weekends. He never stops. And uh, he's 
sometimes the work reveals itself more quickly and sometimes more slowly, but he's always looking for, he's always looking for that. He knows what he recognizes it when he sees it. It's not about us doing anything. And you know, there was always kind of a, a long post uh, schedule in the budget. We kind of knew that. But you're right. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of hard conversations and and arguments back and forth, but not out of line. It was, it was part of the process. I think we all have had conversations with Terry and amongst ourselves as to, again, obviously we were supposed to be here last year, and but we all made that decision together. We all felt like it just wasn't ready yet. And, and as hard a decision as it was, it was in the interest of the film and in Terry's vision. And But there were some difficult times for sure, but uh, very healthy times too. So. Question over there, then the lady over there. Who has Hi, the uh, it's yeah. Rodrigo from Globo Brazil. My question is about the editing process of the film. The film uses five editors, including Daniel Rezende, that was the editor from Seed of God. Could you comment about the, the editing? Say a few words about it. Sure. Um, part of it was because, in fact, we had such a long post schedule, and we knew it would be very difficult both for, some, for someone to, to keep their clarity for that long and frankly be away from their home for that long. Um, so we, we structured it that way, that we had a series of editors who would bring their own visions to it, work through it, and then we always knew that Mark Yoshikawa, who had worked with us on The New World, would be the one to kind of bring it home and, uh, and kind of pull all those pieces together. But everyone worked on every part of the film. And I think Terry, too, just likes to have he likes to bounce ideas off different people and get different points of view. And I think the editor situation was similar in that he liked to have a fresh eye on it. Um, mm -hmm. And then he'd bring people back. It was never about, it didn't work out with somebody. It was more uh -huh. like a different phase mm -hmm. of, of the process. For him. And I think like, uh, I mean, a lot of directors now, I mean, the, the film continues to evolve during post-production. I mean, it, it, and very much so with Terry. And he usually, you know, has quite a, a, little, a bit of footage to contend with. So just the mechanics of allowing the, the normal editorial process to, to, um, to work itself out and at the same time allow him the freedom to continue sort of searching for some things or finding the, 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 the best possible way of, of expressing um, those things that he wants to. It just takes people, takes time. Question over there, the lady, then the gentleman, then the person over there. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Nadia from South Africa. Bradford, you play quite an authoritarian, very strict father. I wonder what your parenting style is like. And also, were any of the children related to you? Because that second child looked very similar to you. <laughs> uh, no relation. Um, I beat my kids regularly. <laughs> and, uh, it seems to do the trick. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and deprive them of meals, so. <laughs> Sir. Uh, Peter Howell, Toronto Star, Canada. Uh, question for Brad Pitt and Jessica Chastain. Uh, you both have a very profound understanding of how the film ended up, but I'm wondering how much of a leap of faith was it going in? How much did Terrence Mack tell you that you were doing, or what did he tell you in advance? All right. Um, well, uh, I got to work with Terry for about three months before we started shooting, and I went to uh, visit him a couple times, and and uh, he suggested paintings that I might look at to kind of enrich this quality of grace. Um, but actually making the film, it's it's really a, a huge lesson into just completely letting go of all control of what you expect an outcome to be. And, you, and that was a, a great lesson that I took away from it and about absolutely being in the moment. Because, like I said earlier, you just can't plan any moment in his films. I mean, there's a, there's a section where a butterfly lands on my hand. It's not in the script and it's not, we didn't put anything on my hand to make it land there, but it's, it's because he creates a set where um, he allows for those moments to happen that he's able to capture it. But yes, it's a leap of faith, and uh, that's the point. That's when, that's when these accidents are going to happen, and, uh, and and you know you're in great hands with with Terry. So um, it's it's uh, uh, 
Not that scary. Mm -hmm. The lady here, the lady here. Hi, I'm Daphne, Dutch Television for UPRO, and I have a question for Mr. Brad Pitt. You just said that you were brought up in Christianity, and I was wondering which element of your religious upbringing could you use to give your character form? And I have the same question for Jessica Justine. You know, I don't know if I thought about it that specifically, I, I just um, because it's, it's um, internalized. Um, but I, you know, just as far as a, uh, uh, a faith that, uh, you know, you grow up, I grew up with this, with this uh, being told that, that God's going to take care of everything and, and, and it doesn't always work out that way. And when it doesn't work out that way, you're then told, well, it's God's will. And then I got my issues, man. You don't want to get me started. Yeah. Yeah. I got my issues. But, um, um, but this, you know, many people find in religion something to be very inspiring and, uh, and actually leads them to opportunities. I myself found it very stifling as an individual and, uh, and a tightness to it that, that I think the, that the father character uh, carried with him. More focus on what you can't do than than experiencing and discovery. Please, go ahead. I wasn't raised um, under any structure, you know, any religious structure, but uh, my family had always been open to different denominations. And with preparing for this, I did a lot of reading uh, um, and actually meditating and um, trying to find it through that aspect. Question here, then here, then here. Hi, Chaz. Ebert, Ebert presents at the Movies US. Um, as I listen to the press conference this morning, it occurs to me that since Cannes is the most auteur-driven festival of all, that the director, as the driver of the film, no matter how shy, should perhaps be here. This is just a, so I'm returning to this just a little bit. I guess he's beyond shy. He's beyond shy. Well, the, the, the question is this. Um, since he's not here, I guess he sent you as his ambassadors. Did he give you any kind of direction as to how you should present the film for him, that's question one, but then well, question two the point, is more Did he tell you what not to say? No. Uh -huh. and, 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 the question, that way. and the other question is, what, what is the conversation behind the scenes with the festival as to when a director is not going to show up? I'm just curious. Mike? Could I just, just the first, I think it was the first part of that. I mean, I think that, you, that's, uh, I mean, the way Terry chooses his people, um, he has a very good sense of, of people, I think, and, and takes a lot of care. And I think that he chooses the people that are around him, and a lot of whom um, have a, a prolonged um, relationship with him, based more on their ability to be able to make their own decisions, to be able to uh, make their own conclusions. And I think the the idea that somehow um, that he would want to e exert influence over, you know, what, how they presented their own opinions or presented information at something like this is uh, is a long way from from Terry as a person. I mean, in in the same way as he ex you know expects out of his audience that you know that he puts the film out there um, and uh, you know he just sort of wants people to sort of make of it what they will and you know um, I think you have to respect that you know and he sees himself I, I believe I can speak for him as, as uh, you know building a house and I, something I don't know why it's accepted that people who make things in our business are not then expected to sell them and I, I don't think it, it computes with him. He wants to focus on the making of and not the real estate, selling of the real estate. It, it is an odd, an odd thing that, that for an artist to sculpt something and then be salesman. Um, to, go ahead. I think to his mind, the most sincere gesture he could make to the audience is to let the audience interpret it 
as they will, each on their own, individually. And any influence on that corrupts the process. You know when you have a favorite song and you hear, then you see the band telling what it's, what it's about, describing the lyrics, and you're immediately disappointed? And you can't listen to that song anymore? <laughs> no? <laughs> All right. we'll, we'll take three more questions. Uh, go ahead, sir. Um, Keith Simonton, IMDb. Um, my question is, the difference between the film that wasn't ready last year and the film that was, is ready this year, um, was there just more of it? Was there anything thematically different? <laughs> the, the one last year was less complete. It just wasn't, you know, if you believe that movies are alive and talking back to you, there's a point at which it's very obvious they're not finished. And then there's a point at which they are. And hopefully you have the privilege and luxury of listening to that, and that being the single voice in the process. Again, the structure is, is unlike anything you've seen. It's, it's quite complex. And uh, uh, so this film was not going to take the normal gestation period. They had to keep honing it, keep shaping it, and uh, figuring out what it is. But it also didn't take any dramatic turns. It didn't suddenly, like last year, didn't suddenly decide it needed to be something else. It was always just an evolution. I wouldn't say there's a huge difference between where we were a year ago and, and where we are now. But there were definitely refinements in part of the evolution that Dee Dee's talking about. So. The lady here, the gentleman over there. I'm Sabine from Germany, ZDF News Magazine. A question for Brad Pitt. Um, beside the temptation to work with uh, Terrence Malick, what attracted you to the story when you read the script? Did you read it as a father? Um, we, we were actually already on it as producers, and, um, and the unfortunate thing about this business sometimes is that great stories um, have a dif great difficulties getting made, even when there's people involved like, like Terry Malick. And uh, we've witnessed a a lot of uh, really strong scripts um, go by the wayside, not get made, and we wanted to ensure that this one did, and and and, um, and so I jumped in. Am I am I answering your question? Oh yeah, I was a little I was a little hesitant about um, playing the the oppressive father, but uh, I I I felt like the story was so important and. And to me, it was really about the, the kid's journey. And, um, you know, I think about everything I do now. My kids are going to see it when they grow up and how are they going to feel. But they, they, they know me as a dad. And, and uh, I hope they'll just uh, think I'm a pretty damn good actor. <laughs> question here, then the gentleman over there. Uh, it's a question for Brad. Uh, Roger Friedman from Showbiz 411. Hi, Brad. Um, I think everybody considers you sort of one of the top three or four biggest movie stars in the world. And you're not doing Mission Impossible kind of movies. You're doing Benjamin Button, you're doing this. You're doing like moody character pieces. Uh, can you talk about how you pick roles and why you're not doing sort of more you know, blockbuster kind of things and why you're doing these sort of intense things? Well, don't count me out of Mission Impossible because <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah, I'm not uh, that highbrow. But, uh, um, you know, like the film itself, you want to discover, you want it to be about something, you want to find something new. I, I always have, I want to find something different. One, and uh, that's, that's been my focus. Also, I think in my, uh, it was about 10 years ago and I started thinking about my favorite films. And uh, they weren't the, the big commercial things, they were things that had a little more depth, that were asking bigger questions or, or really, really funny. Uh, and uh, I do like a comedy. Um, there's some great comedy coming out of America right now. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm thinking of like Zach Galif, you know, Zach and Galifianakis and Jonah Hill and Danny McBride. Anyway, I, 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 I like that too. But, but the point is just to keep uh, messing it up. And, uh, and I figure I only got so many more of these to, that I'll get to do. And, and I want to make sure that. Um, it has some worth to me, and uh, have some worth in, out there instead of something that's more disposable. Sir? Uh, ben Hoyle from the Times in London. Um, I just wanted to ask about the dinosaurs. Um, it's quite a 
a risky thing to introduce dinosaurs into any right. new film, really. You risk <laughs> right? jolting exactly. the audience a bit. Could you tell us whether the dinosaurs were always part of the plan for this film and a bit about um, you know, using them and how, how you did it? It was always a part of the script, um, this story of time as we know it. DV, Sarah? Well, you know, formation of the universe includes dinosaurs. <laughs> there was discussion about the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here and congratulations. Thank you.